I have a bit of a soft spot for Marlebin Station. It's a real underdog as stations go. Most of London's mainline termini are grand affairs with magnificent frontages, bold statements that say, we are here, we are important. Marlebin, not so much. It's located in the back streets. It reminds me of a country house, although I've also heard it described as looking like a low-budget town hall. The point is, it's not very large, or very grand. Marlebin was something of a latecomer. It opened in 1899, decades after most of the British mainline network. It was built by the Great Central Railway, and therein lies a tale. Buckle up. So the Great Central Railway started out as the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincoln Railway, which, as you can probably tell from the name, did not go to London. Instead, the trains travelled over the Great Northern Railway to King's Cross, or the Midland Railway to St Pancras. Generally, it was not a very wealthy railway, and in fact, its directors approached both the Great Northern and Midland Railways about a merger. Neither were keen. In 1864, Edward Watkin became chairman. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you'll recognise that name instantly. Watkin would become chairman of the Metropolitan Railway eight years later. His grand vision was a railway empire from Manchester to Paris. If you're a regular viewer, you'll also recall that he was a very driven man. Not someone who gave up easily. Even when he probably should have done. So he decided that if he couldn't use the existing main lines to London in his great scheme, he'd build his own. The Manchester, Sheffield and Lincoln would extend to London and would take on a new name to reflect its new status. The Great Central Railway. Historians are divided on the Great Central and how necessary or even useful it was. You have to bear in mind that by the late 19th century there were already several routes to the north of England. The idea of building another, particularly when your company doesn't have much money to begin with, may be seen as rather foolhardy. Watkin did attempt to get another northern company on board, the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway, but they weren't impressed. Despite the fact that no one was interested in investing, and the general consensus being that the whole thing was not a good idea, Watkin somehow managed to convince the other directors to go ahead. Finances weren't the only obstacle. Both the Great Northern and the Midland Railway objected to the competition. The projected line would also run through affluent St John's Wood and the clergy orphanage. But the real kicker, the really problematic part, was that the line would have to run beneath Lord's Cricket Ground. Parliament decided that this was, in a very real sense, not cricket, and threw the bill out. In 1893, after much negotiation, an agreement was reached. The line would tunnel under the grounds, and the railway would donate one and three-quarter acres of land to the cricket club. And so at last, the line was approved in 1893. Unfortunately for all concerned, Watkin would retire the following year after a stroke. The original idea was that the new line would share its track with the Metropolitan Railway on the approach to London, with both running into a marvellous expanded station at Baker Street. Unfortunately, with the retirement of Watkin, the Metropolitan came under the leadership of John Bell, who had no interest in his predecessor's railway empire. The Great Central decided they wanted their own terminus, and for the tracks to be quadrupled to prevent bottlenecks on the way into London. Which Bell seems to have rather taken personally. In July 1898, the new terminus opened for goods traffic only. And it was now that Bell decided to take his revenge. Under the original agreement, the Great Central was allowed to use the Metropolitan Line out in Buckinghamshire to access the Great Western Railway. On the 30th of July, Bell and a band of men headed to Quainton Road and blockaded the track as a Great Central coal train approached, refusing to allow it to go any further. The result of this bizarre move was simply for the Great Central to enter into negotiations with the Great Western Railway in order to build a new joint line into Marlebon, which only made them stronger and put the Metropolitan on the back foot. Nice one, Bell. On the 9th of March, 1899, Marlebon Station was ceremonially opened. There was provision for up to ten platforms, although at the time of opening there were only four. 
The whole thing was done very much on the cheap. The Great Central had spent so much getting into London that they couldn't even afford to hire an architect. Instead, H.W. Braddock, one of the company's engineers, was employed. I mean, engineering, architecture, same thing really. The station hotel, normally another means for the railway company to show off, was handed over to Sir John Blundell Maple, a hotelier who saw the new venture as a showcase for his hotel furniture business. In fact, he had a shop in the station itself so that if guests liked what they saw, they could buy their own. The hotel, designed by Colonel Robert Edis, also featured a glazed-over courtyard and a cycle track on the roof. Mabel was happy, but one hotelier who wasn't was Frank Crocker. Crocker mistakenly believed the terminus would be half a mile away by the Regent's Canal, and had built a hotel of his own to serve it. Possibly his source was confused. The Great Central did have an idea to extend along the canal to the docks, but nevertheless the hotel was not the gold mine Crocker hoped for, and to this day it is known as Crocker's Folly. If it was any consolation to Crocker, Marlebon Station didn't make much money for anyone. Those four platforms were more than the station needed. The first passenger train ran on the 15th of March, with four passengers. The busiest train that day had 34. The problem was that there was no real reason for most people to use the Great Central. The most important destinations on the route were already served by other companies which were often quicker. In 1902, Sam Fay took over as general manager. He was a driven man. Under his leadership, the Great Central was going to fight. There would be faster, more comfortable trains and a strong publicity campaign, so everyone knew it. In 1906, the joint line with the Great Western was completed, giving them some commuter traffic. But still, passenger numbers remained disappointing. In 1907, the Bakerloo Railway built their underground station to serve Marlebon. Marlebon had hitherto lacked any underground connection. Originally, there was to be a connection with the Metropolitan Line, which, for obvious reasons, was abandoned. The Bakerloo station was originally to be called Lisson Grove, although I suspect the hand of Sam Fay in ensuring that the new station would open with the name Great Central. In 1916, the hotel got requisitioned by the government for the recovery of wounded soldiers. Two major events for the station took place in 1923. The first was that the Great Central was taken over by the London and North Eastern Railway, and the second was that Wembley Stadium opened, which gave Marlebon plenty of passengers on match days. Despite this, for the most part, Marlebon's passenger numbers remained modest. There were tales of times when staff outnumbered passengers, or when things were so quiet that birdsong could be heard inside the train shed. In 1948, the railways were nationalised. Just before this, the London and North Eastern Railway had bought the hotel out to be their central offices, and the new railway executive moved in, followed by the British Transport Commission and British Road Services. When these moved out, the British Railways Board moved in. British Railways decided to use the old Great Western, Great Central joint line to run all the trains from Princes Risborough and High Wycombe into Marylebone. They also ran two prestigious express services, the South Yorkshireman to Bradford and the wonderfully named Master Cutler to Sheffield. But there was no hiding the fact that Marlebon was severely underperforming. One side effect of this was that the station became a handy location for filming, a hard day's night and Get Carter among others feature scenes filmed here. In the 1950s, efficiency was the name of the game. British Railways was being forced to make cutbacks. This was the era of the infamous Beeching Acts, the mass closure of branch lines based on the recommendations of Dr Richard Beeching. The Great Central Main Line was on the chopping block. Trains were diverted onto other routes and the line was closed in stages during the 60s and early 70s. This closure is controversial to this day. It seemed very likely that Marlebon would follow, and indeed in 1970 British Rail applied for permission to close it. This was not granted. Negotiations followed, and property developers eyed the site hungrily. In 1983, at last, BR announced closure by 1988. But what to do with it? One plan was to convert the station into a coach terminus, with the old main line turned into a bus route. 
This didn't happen for reasons of space, profitability and the lack of both. But in 1986, even as Marleban sat on death row, something remarkable happened. The commuter services of London came under a new division called Network South East. The aim of this new division was to revitalise those commuter services, which it did. Suddenly, Marleban found itself busier than ever before as it absorbed the passenger overspill from Paddington and took pressure off the Metropolitan Line. Part of the site was sold off to fund a refurbishment. New platforms were built. Long-distance services were restored, this time to places like Banbury, Oxford, Birmingham and later even Aberystwyth. It was a true renaissance, and to this day, Marleban is an important terminus. Maybe it isn't Watkins' dream, but London would certainly be worse off for its absence. Well, I do hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. I find Marleban interesting because of how close we came to losing it and how fortunate we were that it was reprieved. It makes me wonder what would have happened in the long run to other stations that were closed under British Railways. It's a curious thought. Anyway, thanks as ever to my donors on Kofi and Patreon. You are the Network Southeast to my minor terminus. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.